about some of the work that uh, the humanitarian open street map team um, are involved with. Kate, would you like to uh, do the switching over? Thank okay, you. thanks. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, from ge geo for some to geo for all. Um, I wasn't always this open source, open data person. Um, and a lot of times people ask me, how can I get a job like yours? And the answer is I'm not really sure. Um, I made it myself. Uh, I work, I'm the executive director of the humanitarian open street map team. We use open source and open data to help communities prepare better for disaster and also to help them respond. So first, I'm going to talk just a little bit about my journey to this open source and open data thing. And uh, it's a little bit of probably preaching to the choir because a lot of you are already in this world. But there's some, maybe you've come to Phosphor G for the first time to sort of see what this open source geo thing is about and uh, how maybe you can start using those tools. Um, so, on the left, I, before I became my uh, open source uh, long-haired hippie self, um, I was a .NET programmer. I worked uh, for a company that did a web GIS and sold data subscription services primarily to the U.S. government. Uh, so last weekend, I was at the Map Action training and I was talking to some other people, and a lot of us have done this. Um, what bad things have you done with maps? Not just lying with maps. What things were you like, well, I guess maybe I needed a job. I was young, <laughs> needed money. Um, the other person was talking about mapping endangered species for development. Um, so how many newts did you kill with your maps? That sort of thing. Mine was uh, mapping for Washington, D.C. lobbyists. Uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, the movie Thank You for Smoking. This is a scene from it. Um, so you have someone working for the tobacco company, someone working for uh, alcohol, and someone working for guns. So the typical Washington, D.C. lobbyist scene. So we used to make maps that um, essentially would say things like, if you increase the, the alcohol tax or the tobacco tax over here, all these jobs are going to disappear. So you could take that map to a congressman and say, oh my god, what are you going to do? if you raise the tax on cigarettes or tobacco, um, and tracking membership of organizations and things like that. But essentially using maps so you can convince politicians to do whatever corporate interests we're interested in. Um, second one, uh, this is a shot of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, when, uh, right after the um, hurricane had hit um, New Orleans, I charged $100,000 worth of data to my boss's Amex card. I didn't know that was shut off an Amex card, but apparently it does. Um, and then we sold that to the U.S. government for some ungodly amount of money, I suspect. I was too low down to know what that amount actually would be. Um, I like to think that today, that maybe buying a bunch of hotel data on an Amex card isn't really a profitable business model. So um, it was about... Uh, 2009, I started to sort of leave that job, and I'd also started mapping an open street map. And so as I was leaving the job, I talked about how, I, I had been talking about open street map for a while, and their attitude was, that'll never work. Even though I think in 2009, it was already working. Um, and I went to work uh, for GUIQ, where it was, there was more of a focus of, on open data, and there was some, um, open source projects as well. Uh, the first project I worked on was an open source geocoder. The biggest argument at the company I worked for before was why can't you go find an open source geocoder so we can use it to make money but not contribute back. So it was rewarding to actually be able to move forward into using software that other people could use. Um, so I'm going to give a little background uh, now switching a little bit more into the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, which actually started as an idea, which I found out last week, in 2005, um, when Mikkel Marin first uh, presented it at a JRC meeting uh, as the idea of you could use OpenStreetMap for disaster planning. Um, Hot and I became friends in 2010. Um, that was when I first got it started. I had been mapping an OpenStreetMap for about a year before. 
Um, and then the earthquake in Haiti happened. Um, some of you have probably seen this screenshot before. Um, and OpenStreetMap contributors who want to yell, I've used the wrong attribution. These screenshots are actually before OpenStreetMap changed the license. Um, but so here you see uh, Port-au-Prince, and you see the before and after. And the first week, the OpenStreetMap community did this. And what happened was the, earth the earthquake happened, and people in OpenStreetMap just started mapping, not really discussing it. Um, and just thought, OK, we're, we'll trace some old satellite imagery we have. And after about the first couple hours, people uh, mostly on IRC started talking about it. And more and more people started mapping. Uh, at the end of the, that month, 600 people had contributed to OpenStreetMap from all over the world um, to make a detailed map. Um, and this was not the first time OpenStreetMap had been used by official organizations in a response. Uh, the first time had been a map action map in the Philippines in 2009, but it was the first time it was really shown that it could be really important to have data quickly in a disaster. Um, and this is one of the shots where, um, so this is January 22nd, a week and a half after the earthquake. Uh, this is a search and rescue um, team out of Fairfax County, Virginia in the United States. Uh, you can tell he didn't really think his picture would get used in presentations all over the world um, since it's a little blurry. Uh, but so this is where we started to see people were actually using the data on the ground, but then you also had more official, um, larger organizations in the Emergency Operations Center, like the Pan American Health Organization, the World Bank, uh, Map Action Maps, people on the ground were asking for open street map, which was really the first time. Um, what's funny, though, is where I come in with this, uh, so this is the DC Roller Girls. I don't know if you're familiar with roller derby. Um, it's a sport which involves people on roller skates checking each other, similar to hockey. Um, and so in 2010, HOT, um, the International Organization on Migration, wanted to write HOT a check. HOT had been an idea for five years, but we weren't anyone you could write a check to. Um, but I had been on the board of directors of the DC Roller Girls when they obtained nonprofit status. So I said, heck, I'm not a lawyer, but I can fill out nonprofit paperwork. And um, so then we became incorporated, because um, we had been traveling to Haiti since the earthquake and training people, but usually in partnership with other groups. Uh, uh, at one point, Map Action helped us. Uh, Open Geo let some of us subcontract, because we were just sort of a gang of open source and open data enthusiasts that wanted to help. So. Uh, now I'm mostly going to talk about what HOT's been doing since then. Um, I like to think of this as, oh, the places your software will go. Um, because without people developing open source tools, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. Uh, we do a lot of workshops. And so we train a lot of software. And we're able, because it's free and open source, to do two things. Simply give it to them for free. And two, if there's problems or bugs, fix them quickly or add features. One thing is, your software doesn't just have to come. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, we have a lot of volunteer work. Um, we sometimes have contract positions. Uh, we always need technical people to help. Um, I've been uh, talking about the idea of a hot vacation for a while. Um, so for example, uh, I'm primarily based out of Jakarta, and we've had volunteers come. And Jakarta is not the amazing vacation space you would think it was, but Nearby, there's beautiful beaches, other things. You know, People travel to Bali on holiday all the time. And it's the sort of thing where you can combine volunteering with going and seeing a beautiful country. And there's a lot of situations like that as well. So um, after the initial work in Haiti, um, we continue to work there today. Um, our last trip was around May of this year. Um, this is a team here um, of both HOT and Community OpenStreetMap Haiti um, in a project in San Marc recently this year. In case you're wondering where your software is, it's in those black boxes that say OSM on them. So what we do is we create um, essentially OpenStreetMap kits. So you get a computer, GPSs, all the cables to hook it together, a printer and scanner. Um, we're slowly phasing out the scanner because mobile phones can do the same thing now. Um, and you have a mapping kit in a box. And then we put it in a waterproof Pelican case with locks so it can be secure. Um, and find 
uh, partners that can, can keep it and allow people to have, have access to the technology so that when we go give a workshop, at the end, they're not like, oh, I learned all these cool, thi cool things, but I don't have a computer. I don't have a GPS. I don't have access to the internet. So to facilitate that. Here's another uh, typical mapping in Haiti um, by motorbike GPS up in Capetian. Same thing. We continue to map um, in Haiti, both for earthquake recovery, but in this case of Capetian, it's to teach um, youth how to use technology so maybe they can get a better job someday and also to map a commune, um, a province in the area, so that people have that ec uh, base map data so you can make planning decisions, economic decisions, see where businesses are, and measure resources. Just some more of our team uh, from down in Capetian. So after, um, it was about a year and a half after we had been working in Haiti, um, the question came about um, through uh, AusAid and the World Bank, what could you do if you mapped ahead of time? So it was amazing that the OpenStreetMap community did all of this mapping after the earthquake in Haiti. But there was no reason that data couldn't have existed before and then been updated. So we began a pilot in Indonesia, and the idea was let's start mapping together ahead of time. Um, one of the groups we worked with um, was a community mapping, uh, with, to do community mapping was community strengthening groups in eastern Indonesia. Um, there was another AusAid program there. So AusAid through the Australia Facility for Disaster Risk Reduction was helping us, it was funding us to do a pilot to see about using OpenStreetMap. But there was this other group that were doing community mapping. The map you see here was made in Corel Draw, so there's nothing geographic about it. Um, and what it's saying is it's mapping the resources of the community as well as every single house in that community, essentially uh, who's poor, who's rich, who's middle income, and how do they relate to those resources. And each village decides what it means to be poor. So you can imagine if the village has a discussion and decided to change slightly what it means to be poor, you have to go in and recolor everything manually in Corel Draw. Think about what you can do with GIS to not do that. Um, and backing up this data, there are Excel spreadsheets of detailed data. So it is data driven, but the actual map making was not. So we started working with those groups um, to see if digital tools could make it easier. Um, and one of the things that was funny was we were really sort of worried about printing or how people would use the tools. And a big part of it was sort of printing maps, taping them together, taking them to a printer where you could get a large format map. But then I started getting uh, pictures like this from community centers. So the local um, organizations we were working with had just um, essentially picked up a projector and were going around and showing like QGIS and showing the Java OpenStreetMap edi editor to the villages they were working with and just having the discussion on the wall like this. Um, and we tried a variety of other things within this first year. We had a university contest where whoever could map the most buildings got a scholarship to Phosphor G. This was in Denver. Um, and just working with other groups already doing mapping. The reason you don't see anyone who's won a mapping contest this year was um, in analyzing it. Um, so people mapped a lot for the contest, but never mapped anything again. So didn't really work as far as an incentive structure for that. So this year we've been working on a program, uh, Scenario Development for Contingency Planning. And what that means is you develop a scenario of how a disaster might happen, and then you plan for how, um, as a disaster management agency, you'll react. How much food you need, how many hygiene kits, where can you evacuate people? And so what we're, we're doing in partnership with AIFDR is we provide training in those tools so that disaster managers can actually make decisions using software. Um, the main uh, software we use is InnoSafe, so it's impact modeling software. And what we do is, so the OpenStreetMap data can serve as um, sort of the base infrastructure data, and then you can have a scientific model that says, for example, uh, this type of tsunami happened, and you can say how many houses will be flooded, or in the case of an earthquake, what percentage of houses will be destroyed. So we've been doing workshops um, 
and six provinces in Indonesia uh, to teach this. And um, as I said, it's OpenStreetMap, Quantum GIS, and um, InnoSafe. Uh, we've also worked, experimented a li little bit with other tools, like using PostGIS um, for some of the more advanced students. But the main goal is to be able to say, OK, what would happen in a disaster? Have a report says, OK, this is how we need to plan, and then develop a contingency plan. Um, Q just gets around a lot. Um, I don't know if you recognize the gentleman in the foreground, but that's the president of Indonesia. He's getting a demonstration of how InnoSafe and Quantum GIS can help make better decisions about flooding in Jakarta. So all the places your software goes, it goes in front of the leader of the fourth most populous country in the world. Pretty awesome, huh? Um, so in Indonesia, we had a new experience happen this year. Uh, sorry the picture is so bad. Uh, when you're Instagramming things heading home from the airport during a flood, it doesn't occur to you those pictures might be useful later. Um, so in January this year, Jakarta had one of the worst floods it had had in five years. Um, my team was actually not in the city at the time. We were out giving a workshop in one of those other places. But we came back to it uh, and took a bus home. Uh, it took some of us a long time because there was more than a meter flooding in a lot of places. What was interesting from an open data perspective, however, was um, that for the first time, OpenStreetMap was used in showing um, people where the flooding had actually happened. So this is a, um, this is a map um, from the Disaster Management Agency showing what, um, what areas are flooded. Um, and this was published on their website. There was also a web map, um, but one of the biggest problems was people wanted information so badly, as soon as they put it up, the server would fall over because there was that much demand for information. And it's one of the first times um, they've been able to provide it fairly well. Um, and overall in the program, the thing I'm most uh, proud of this year is we mapped over a million buildings since the beginning. And this is through uh, training over 500 people um, about OpenStreetMap. Um, this is our Facebook badge for it. It says, I contributed to mapping a million buildings um, in OpenStreetMap. Uh, we do a lot of social media outreach. So it's really been exciting what has happened in Jakarta. Um, we're also releasing um, uh, all of all, as the data and the software being open is important. But having good manuals are also extremely important so people can get started. Uh, so uh, we've been working on a curriculum with a specialist. Um, and it's teaching beginner and intermediate and trainer level uh, of these tools, uh, trainer level skills for these tools. And it's going to be submitted this year to the Indonesian government. And with the pending approval, will actually be an official training program of the government. Um, I think it'll be the first time, at least for OpenStreetMap, that a national government will have um, an official curriculum for this. Um, wouldn't be complete without pictures of the team. Um, so nine people work for HOT in Indonesia. Uh, we share an office with Wikimedia Indonesia. Um, what's core to that is a partnership of people who are committed to open data and open knowledge. Our um, office has only been in existence uh, since mid-June. And this was our first barbecue a couple of weeks ago of getting everyone together, inviting uh, friends and partners uh, with similar in interests uh, to come join us. So we don't just work in Haiti and Indonesia. Um, we've also been uh, supporting volunteers um, through the Eurosha project. And what this uh, program does is it supports uh, young European volunteers for six months in um, countries in Africa to help with information management of local partners. Um, a big part of that ended up being OpenStreetMap, but um, also Sahana was taught, um, which is a um, crisis uh, uh, information management system. And so HOT provided the technical assistance in the field. So some of our staff went for two weeks twice, once to set the volunteers up, and once to check in and see if they needed uh, technical assistance. Um, and so this was in the Central African Republic, uh, Kenya, uh, Cameroon, and um, I'm blanking on one, sorry. 
Um, and this is uh, actually one of the initial training workshops. There's some people in this room who, um, this took place in France, who came and helped um, from this community. Um, so it's great we get to use your software, but also people come and help, help us train it as well. And then it goes all over the world. Um, this is a re recent uh, project in Dhaka, which is um, through the Open Cities Project. Um, so the Open, Open Cities Project is an initiative through the World Bank to map 100 cities in Asia that are prone to disaster. Um, and so the idea is if you have this detailed information, you can better plan. Um, and um, it's amazing to me that HOT has moved to so many other so many countries. From the last sl slide, you can tell that I probably should have them written on my hand or something. Um, and so the recent o Open Cities Project um, portion that we were involved in was in Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Um, once again, teaching people how to collect information. And this is working with government and universities and civil society groups. A lot of time, you need a big community to build a map. So y you need to do outreach to whoever's interested, whoever can benefit from that data. Um, we've also been working in Senegal for a while. Uh, we had a volunteer um, community mobilizer uh, take a break from university and spend six months down there um, teaching. And in that case, it's just who wants to learn about OpenStreetMap. We provide some equipment and we par partner with co-working facilities and hacker spaces and see who we can train. Um, and take very, very detailed information. Um, I'm sure many of you use OpenStreetMap. Um, and where we're standing today is very detailed. But there's um, also plenty of other places in the world where there's a uh, it may be the only option for a detailed map. I would think in Nottingham, there's probably government, there are government options, but other places, there aren't. So, sort of like I had to make my job myself, we make our maps ourselves. Um, something else that we've been doing, um, in partnership with the American Red Cross in um, Ghana, is asking volunteers from OpenStreetMap uh, to essentially just di digitize every building in an area. Uh, and these are volunteers uh, who can help from the comfort of their own home. And uh, we have a piece of software called a tasking manager where you can check out an area to work on. Uh, what was awesome about this is then um, Robert Bannock, who I assume is somewhere around here, um, went down to Gulu and actually um, worked with people to add more detailed information that you can't get from a satellite. And so that was used to make a fire risk map. Um, the specific reason you need a fire risk map uh, in, in this case actually, is um, these are the huts that people were digitizing. What was interesting is um, if you've only looked at satellite imagery of your area and you see, and, and like me, you're, uh, and you're from Europe or North America, you may not realize you're looking at someone's home and um, the potential for it to burn when it's made out of materials like this. Um, another great friend of HOT and OpenStreetMap is MapAction. Um, so in the Philippines, there was a typhoon in December of last year um, with heavy flooding. And what's awesome there um, is that the OpenStreetMap community has been doing response to flooding and typhoons on their own since before HOT was really more than an idea. Um, and so that base data goes into uh, maps used by um, response on the ground that MapAction makes. Um, for a little um, explanation, if you don't know what Map Action is, you should definitely visit their booth and talk to them. But essentially, it's an elite GIS team that travels to disaster sites and they provide GIS support. Um, so a lot of that is making maps. Um, and in this case, in partnership with uh, UN OCHA, which is the Office for Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs at the United Nations. Um, sometimes we actually don't do things OpenStreetMap related, um, despite the name. Uh, so Hurricane Sandy um, hit New York City this year. Um, maybe Anyway, the thing that we ended up doing is we forked a, a program called MapMill, which the public laboratory uses 
for um, sorting imagery. So they take balloon imagery, and then you have to sort through the thousand pictures you took to find one that's good. What we did instead is the Civil Air Patrol, which is the United States Air Force Auxiliary, actually goes and takes pictures of every major disaster in the United States. They have over 500 Cessnas on standby with volunteers. But they used to just go on a DVD to the incident commander, and maybe they got used, maybe they didn't. The photos were geolocated and um, fairly high resolution, just a regular um, camera. And myself and Skylar Earl had um, forked this application at an exercise earlier in the year to see if we could make that information useful. And so what this does is it matches um, things to the national grid, the pictures of the national grid, and then we ask people to rate the damage. Is there no damage? Is there some damage? Is there a lot? And then that goes into an average, so people get a grid that says, okay, this area has heavy damage. So it's just an estimate, but then someone can go on the ground and check things out. What was amazing was 6,000 people sorted images. First time we, um, sort of the typical, the first, in the initial response, we put a server up. Immediately, it fell over. Put a much bigger server up, we were okay. Um, but it, allow, it allowed um, easier damage assessment on the ground and helping find people, um, find out where people needed help. And all this effort that goes into these flying planes and taking images was done, uh, was actually used in a way where people could easily interpret it. Um, another project we did unrelated to, um, typically we're in developing countries or the global south as some people call it, but we've worked in the United States and we also were able to travel with OpenStreetMap Japan to the tsunami affected areas as part of State of the Map, um, which is in Tokyo last year. Here we are in Kamashi um, and we were able just to have a mapping party with local groups um, because complete you know, cities and uh, complete villages are gone. And as things are built back, you can slowly um, map the change. Because um, right now, there's, um, there's entire strip malls that are made of trailers. It, it's amazing. Because um, I had never been to a disaster area in a country with resources, essentially. Um, and so it, HOT, in conjunction with OpenStreetMap Japan, was able to go just do some mapping, essentially. Um, if, um, if any of this inspires you, you can always get involved with HOT, but I also wanted to mention the Digital Humanitarian Network, which is a, it's sort of an umbrella group that brings together these digital volunteer groups like HOT, um, the Standby Task Force, um, Datakind, Translators Without Borders, all these different groups doing volunteering and helps coordinate it. And what it does is if you're an official organization and you see all these volunteer groups, who do you talk to? So it gives, um, an actual uh, specific place that people can go to talk. Um, and I'm a coordinator for it, there's four of us, and we filter that and help figure out what groups can actually help uh, solve whatever the problem may be. Um, so we're not all about training, we do do some other things. Um, I wanted to mention Learn OSM. So this is the, I think the first, um, large OpenStreetMap manual available online. It's currently in eight languages. Um, and it's just designed so people can get started. Uh, a lot of OpenStreetMap information is in a wiki. And most of us probably have some experience finding something in a wiki and it's out of date or di not uh, difficult to find. And sure, you can go fix that. But if you're, getting, if you're just getting started, you just want to be able to go through the steps. Um, so uh, uh, in partnership with Mapbox, who designed the site for us. Um, we've made this available online. Uh, all the materials are in GitHub, so it's possible to fork it, um, submit a patch, translate it into another language. Uh, what's been sort of amazing about this is when we first released it, it was only in English and Indonesian. And apparently if you release things in English in a language that people perceive that not that many people speak, though they do, um, you're like, well, why isn't it in my language? And so people just started translating immediately. because they're like, well, it's in Indonesian. Why isn't it in uh, Portuguese or Japanese or German, et cetera. Um, one of our other tools is um, allows people to export data out of OpenStreetMap. Uh, we continue, it's a Ruby on Rails project and we continue to uh, add um, items to it. Uh, our newest feature that I'm excited about is it actually allows translation of data. 
So we talk about translation of software and manuals, but if the data is in English, for example, and it's just difficult to understand. So the OpenStreetMap data is all in English. Um, that's just how the, the base tagging system is, is in English. It's just the rule of sort of the community. Um, so what this lets you do is build a lookup table. So then you could export your data and get it in another language. Because um, it's easy to enter OpenStreetMap data in, the, in your language, um, essentially through translation of the tools. But getting it back out in English, a lot of people have no idea what's going on at that point. Um, this is the tasking manager that I referred to earlier. So it's a relatively simple idea, um, but for us it's been really important. It allows people to pick a grid to go digitize or work on and then check it back in. Um, during the earthquake in Haiti, we told people, just kind of map somewhere. Just find a blank spot. But if you're new, um, or there's just a lot going on, it can be difficult. So that eliminates the problem. Um, currently, we're still um, working in uh, Sudan where there's heavy, heavy flooding. Um, if you know how to edit an open street map, you can always log in. It's tasks.hotosm.org. And take a square and digitize it. I also wanted to give a little uh, mention. We have a technical working group. We meet every other Monday um, on IRC. Our next meeting is this Monday. So if any of this stuff sounds interesting and you think you can help from a technical perspective, join in. See what's, uh, what we're working on and how, if you have ideas of how we might help, uh, you might help. And these are relatively informal, um, uh, well, IRC meetings. Finally, I want to give one more shout out to joining the gang, coming on a hot vacation, really volunteering or working for us. Um, so this is Joseph Reeves, uh, one of HOT's board members and uh, volunteer, uh, came up with, came to, with us to help uh, train people in Indonesia last year and um, obviously made some friends. So if any of this sounds good to you um, and you're interested, uh, we'd love to have some help. Um, and I personally think it's a lot of fun. Uh, I often get accused of uh, my Facebook page looking like I'm on vacation all the time. Really, it's I get to, there's a lot of cool places in the world that need help. So, thank you very much. Um, I, hope, uh, I hope you learned a little bit more about what HOT's about um, and the path from proprietary uh, and closed software to open data and uh, open software and not mapping for evil. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> so we'll, uh, we'll switch uh, straight across. It.